All right, this is um, the section 2.2 notes. The first page is um, previous knowledge that's useful for this section. So I give you the slope formula and um, I don't really give you any examples there because we've done slope already. Um, but this is just a reminder that slope's coming up again. So this is what it is. Um, another thing that you already know is evaluating functions for values. So if we have the function f of x equals x squared plus 2x plus 5, um, then you can plug in different values. Let me make sure my recording is working here. Capture primary screen. Yeah, I believe it is. And microphone, yeah, okay. Um, so f of 1 would just mean replace x with 1, or substitute x with 1. So 1 squared plus 2 times 1 plus 5 um, would be 1 plus 2 is 3, it would be 8. Um, sometimes it just asks you to plug another variable in. So replace x with h and you get h squared plus 2h plus 5. And you can't really do anything else with that, you're just replacing one variable for another. And then in the last one, this is going to be the toughest one you encounter, f of x plus h. Well, it means the same thing as the previous ones, you just replace x with x plus h. So if we just look at the first part here, this is the replacing, where it was x squared, we make it x plus h squared. Where it was just an x, we put x plus h. And then from there, it's just a bit of algebra to do. It's a really good thing to memorize that x plus h squared. Well, that's the same as saying x plus h times x plus h, and then you FOIL x times x is x squared, and then we have h times x, and then x times h, and then h squared. Well, x, hx and xh are the same thing, so you can combine them and you get 2xh. So if you just memorize that x plus h squared is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, life is going to get a little easier for you. So this part here, if you memorize it, you can just spit it out. Distribute the 2 to the x and the h, and you get 2x plus 2h, and then add 5. So this is a building block for something to come. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that again in example D of um, number 3. So f of 0 would just be plugging 0 into the function given, and you're just going to get 7. f of 4, 4 squared minus 2 times 4 plus 7, it's 16 minus 8 plus 7. Now make sure to follow the order of operations here. You have to do 16 minus 8 first because it comes first. And when you're just looking at addition and subtraction, you just do whatever comes first from left to right. So a 16 minus 8 is 8, add the 7, and we get 15. Okay, um, f of h. Like above, all you're doing is replacing, oops, it's not plus, it is... Um, minus, so minus 2h plus 7. And then finally the last one, the harder one now, we're going to get x plus h squared minus 2 times x plus h and then plus 7. Alright, so if you've memorized x plus h squared, you know that it's just x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, and you can just spit it out. Distribute the negative 2. Make sure you distribute it all the way, and then add the 7. 
And that's it. We can't simplify that or do anything else. It's going to be that ugly. And then I left you some space for questions that you have um, that you can ask me about the review. So that's a good place to say, well, I really don't understand why this is true. Um, and then you can ask that question and and hopefully that will um, make it even easier for you to do the next part. Alright, number one for the 2.2 lecture. So we did the review. Now we're on to semi new stuff. <coughs> Alright. It says to read through the first example in your book. So this is um, a lot of this stuff you were supposed to do using your book in advance. So make sure before you continue watching this video that you went through your textbook and filled in all the stuff that you can fill in. So there's an example in the book that looks very similar to this, um, but the questions that I ask are a little different. So um, you're dropping a tomato off the top of a building and answering questions about it. So a chart is given that tells you what at what time the tomato is at what height. First question, how long did it take for the tomato to reach 84 feet? Well, if you look on the table, the tomato was at 84 feet after one second. So it took one second. How far did the tomato fall by the second second? So if we look on the table, after two seconds we see that it's at a height of 36. So to find how much it fell, then we need to do 100 minus 36, which is 64 feet. How far did the tomato fall at time zero? At time zero, it was still at a height of 100 feet, so it hadn't fell at all, so zero feet. How far did the tomato fall between one and two seconds? So for that one, um, if we look at one second, it was at 84 feet. After two seconds, it was at 36 feet. And if you subtract those two numbers, you get 48 feet. All right, num part E, we get a little bit more into new material, but it's still review. What was the average velocity of the tomato between t equals 0.5 and t equals 1.5 seconds? To get that one, we need to look to see, well, we know what our bottom numbers are. We're looking at the difference in time on the bottom, um, and then the difference in the height on the top. So that would be 64 at 1.5 seconds and 96 at 0.5 seconds. So we're going to get negative 32 over 1 which is simply negative 32 feet per second. So you might be wondering how you can have a velocity that's negative. The negative simply means um, direction. So if the, the tomato is falling down, so the velocity for this tomato the entire time will be negative. If the tomato is thrown up first, then it would have a positive velocity why it was going in that um, up direction. Um, now F, how fast the tomato was falling one second after it was dropped as an example of instantaneous velocity. And that's going to be our focus in this section is um, we look at average velocity our average rate of change and we're going to 
take a leap from that to instantaneous velocity or instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so number two is um, something that you would fill in from using the book. Um, but it does say use your own words. So um, if you're stuck on this one, average velocity is change in position. over change in time. Okay, and instantaneous velocity is the velocity at a certain time. Or a specific time. All right, number three, what again was from your book. Um, so you should have had secant line here. So if we just wanted slope of a straight line, we just take two points and use a slope formula. But if you want um, average rate of change on a curve, um, then you can't really talk about slope on a curve, but you can talk about taking two points on that curve, drawing a straight line between them, the secant line, and then finding slope of that. And that gives you an estimate um, or average of what the velocity is. So average velocity can be found by taking the slope Find the average velocity between 1, 0, and 0.5, negative 2, and then sketch it. So let's plot those points. Here is 1, 0, and 0.5, negative 2. So if I draw a straight line or a secant line between them, that's what I'm trying to find the slope of. So M, and we put secant here just to specify that it's slope of a secant line. It's going to be negative 2 minus 0 over 0.5 minus 1. So we get negative 2 over 0.5, which is going to be over negative 0.5. That is positive 4. So that secant line has a slope a positive 4, which also gives us the average velocity between two points on that curve. Alright, here's an example that you wouldn't, well, yeah, I wanted you to try it on your own, but um, I'm going to go over it as well. So we have um, a function x squared plus 2x and we need to fill in the table. Um, the first row is done for us as an example to follow. And we're trying to answer the question, as x gets closer to 1, what is the slope of the secant line getting closer to? That is, uh, and then note that when x is 1, if you plug 1 in the function, you get that y or f of x is 3. So, um, the first one's done for us. What happened is you plug 1.1 into the function and you get 3.41. And then you use that in the slope formula to get the slope of the secant line. So when you plug 1.05 in, you get 3.2025. And then if you use the slope formula, to get the slope of the secant line, you do 3.2025 minus 3, because that's what f of 1 is, over 
0.05 minus 1. And that is 4.05. When you plug 1.025 in, we get 3.100625. And I'm just going to tell you that this one's 4.025. And I'm just going to fill this in for you so you have it. Um, if you have any questions on how I got the numbers or if you get different numbers, then let me know. So you can probably see what's happening here. Now we're looking at the other side of 1. 0.9, we get 2.61, um, and we get 3.9. Then 2.8025 and 3.95. Two oh four and three point nine eight two point nine six oh one three point nine nine two point nine nine two zero zero four and three point nine nine eight. So if we look at this number, because these are the closest numbers to 1, and this one, um, we can probably deduce that if we kept getting closer and closer to 1, the value of that slope is 4. So we can take a guess that the slope um, approaches 4 of those secant lines. When we use words like gets closer to, this um, often means that the limit process is involved. Remember we talked about limit. As one value gets closer and closer to this value, then what does this other value do? Get closer to. Um, it turns out that as two points used to find the secant line get closer together, they are pr practically the same point and you get the tangent line at that point as seen in the picture below. It's not a great picture, but it's the best one I could find out there. Um, you can see that we start with Q being up here and P down here. We draw the line between them, all right, and then when Q gets a little closer each time, to P, and you'll notice that the slope is decreasing, and then once Q gets to be, you know, basically the same as P, we get this orangey red line, that's the tangent line at P. So the, the Q's, or the secant lines, converge to the tangent line. Here's another example, and we're going to come back to um, tangent line in a moment. Um, but here's another example. What is the slope of the line through negative 2, 4 and x, y? For y equals x squared. And x equals negative 1.98 and x equals negative 2.03. x equals negative 2 plus h. So let's draw ourselves a table with x and y. And the first value, and the value we're centered around here is negative 2, 4. And then they tell us to do negative 1.98 and negative 2.03, but they didn't give us the y values for those. All you need to do is square them to get the y value. 3.9204 and negative 2.03 squared is 4. 1209. And we can look at a picture of this. It's a little bit sloppy of a picture, but we're focusing on the point negative 2, 4, and this is just a basic parabola. I will stop that. Sometimes it won't let me. Alright, we'll just delete that and start over. All 
Alright, negative 2, 4, and then... <laughs> it's not gonna let me do this. Oh. There we go. Not exactly what I wanted, but good enough. And then, um, it's probably not going to let me do this, but we're looking at a point really close to negative 2 on the left side and on the right side. And we're looking at um, finding the slope between those two points. So for m secant 1, that's with the negative 9.8, we get 3.9204 minus 4 all over negative 1.98 minus a negative 2 and that equals negative 3.98 we look at the secant line of the other point it's 4.1209 minus 4 over negative 2.03 minus negative 2 and that's equal to negative 4.03 so if we look at these values as we're getting close to negative 2 it looks like our slope is converting to 4 and that's what they're asking with x equals negative 2 plus h it's saying negative 2 plus um, a, a small value, and that value could be negative as well, um, to get a number on each side. So it's just saying, you know, h is getting very, very small, close to zero. What is our secant, the slope of our secant doing? And the answer is, it is converging to negative 4. So as x approaches negative 2, the slope approaches negative 4. All right, instantaneous velocity is the slope of the tangent line. Slope of the tangent to the graph. What is a tangent line? Well, I want you to Google tangent line. Um, have some fun with it and look at several websites and try to make an answer that makes sense to you. And I wanted you to write it up in that space below. Um, so I'll leave that for you. And then um, I have this applet, tangent line applet, that you can play with as well. Um, so let's go look at that, if it works. Okay. So I asked you to pick x squared from the menu and then put the slope, the speed on very slow. It's still too fast, but here's your secant line. One point here and one point here. Um, if you hit play, you can see the secant converging to the tangent. And then you can start it over using this and hit play again. And then you can look at other graphs And it's just a little like um, movie showing you what happens as the secant lines get closer and closer to the tangent line. All right, so it can be confusing on how to draw a tangent line. Maybe you came across this in your Google search and maybe you didn't, but this is probably the most straightforward way to think of it. You have some kind of curve, and let's say we want to put a tangent line. Oh, it's going to do this to me again, huh? Right here. All 
Uh, let me try that again. So I'll put one there and one here. So if you drew a circle, oh, this is frustrating. I have to be a little quicker. If I draw a circle around this point, the tangent line is going to be perpendicular. If you draw a point now from the, the edge of that circle, um, well, my tangent line doesn't, isn't quite touching there, but if you draw a line from the edge of the circle, from that point that we want the, t the, the line on, or the tangent line, and you draw it, you know, you're drawing a radius to the center of the circle, your tangent line is going to be perpendicular to that. So if we try another one, it's probably going to be, I'll just draw another picture here. Here's another curve, and we want a tangent right here. So we draw our circle on the inside of the curve, draw a line to the center of the circle, and then your tangent is going to be perpendicular meaning they form 90 degree angles from that line. So, uh, I know my drawings kind of suck, but if we go, um, oh, didn't mean to cross out those things. If we go down to the next example, um, and this one should work a little better because there's already a graph there. We need to draw a tangent line at x equals negative 4. Well, first plot your point at x equals negative 4. Then draw a circle on the inside of that. <laughs> okay, that's not what I wanted. Draw a circle on the inside of the curve. Draw a line now from the center of the circle to your point and then draw a line perpendicular to that. And then negative 1.5, my point would be right here. Go circle inside the curve. Okay, straight line down and then perpendicular at one dot circle line to the center and then line perpendicular and last but not least so two dot circle inside straight line to the center and then perpendicular so you'll notice um, at 2 and at negative 1.5, the lines are horizontal. x equals 2 and 1.5. The tangent line is horizontal. Meaning, the slope is 0. That's just something to keep in the back of your mind for now. All right, lots of stuff to fill in from your book. 13, 14, and 15 are all different ways to um, express the derivative. So, the derivative of a function f at point x, f of x, is the instantaneous rate of change. Well, that's, we, we've already talked about that. We've talked about that with velocity. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line to the graph f at point x, f of x. The derivative is the slope of the curve f of x at the point x, f of x. The function is called differentiable at 
at x f of x if its derivative exists at x f of x. The notation derivative of y equals f of x with respect to x is written as f prime of x read aloud as f prime of x. That's just how we read that. Um, or we could say y prime or dy dx um, or df dx. The fractional notation is called Leibniz. notation and it looks like a fraction because the derivative is slope. In fact this is simply dy dx written in Roman letters instead of um, or change in y over change in x instead of Greek letters. So there's all different kinds of ways we can express derivatives. Alright we find the derivative of a function or take the derivative of a function. This is just to make sure that we understand the uh, language. Or we differentiate. A function. We use the adaptation of the dy dx notation to mean find the derivative of. f of x. Oh, stupid things. Not gonna let me write f of x. Alright. Um, so d dx of f of x is the same as df dx. Now, on to the formal definition of a derivative. f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now, this part of it you have you've seen before, it's called the difference quotient. And it's really just the slope formula. It is saying that if we take the function of x and we add a little bit to it or take away if h is negative, um, and then subtract the value of just f of x. So that's the change of the y values. And then h um, is the change in the x values because x plus h minus x will give you h. So this is really all just slope. But when you add the limit to it, it makes it a derivative or instantaneous rate of change because we're saying that h is going to get so small that it's not, it's barely even there anymore. So the practical definition, the derivative can be appro um, approximated by looking at an average rate of change or the slope of a secant line over a very tiny interval. The tinier the interval, the closer this is to the true instantaneous rate of change, slope of the tangent line or the slope of the curve. Alright, so here's some examples using the formal definition of a limit or the formal algebraic um, definition of a derivative to find the derivative. So we're given f of x equals 3x minus 7. And we want to find f prime of x for the derivative. So we're going to use the limit 
as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h, so I want to substitute x with x plus h, so I get 3 times x plus h minus 7. So this is the f of x plus h part. Alright, and then we're going to subtract f of x. Well, f of x is just 3x minus 7. And that's all over h. So this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 3x plus 3h minus 7 minus 3x plus 7 all over h. And if you've done this correctly, the last, the, the everything after the minus f of x should cancel out. And then your h's can also um, divide out and you just get the limit as h approaches 0 of 3 and the limit of a constant is just that constant. So the answer is f prime of x or the derivative of f of x is simply 3. In order to do the next one, I'm going to have to erase everything. So bear with me. Or fast forward. B is f of x equals x squared plus 3x. Again, we want the derivative. So f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. Alright, replace x with x plus h, so that's x plus h squared, which we talked about earlier, plus 3 times x plus h. Now subtract the entire function, so x squared plus 3x, and put the whole thing over h. Alright, so we have hopefully memorized x plus h squared. We can just spit that out. It's x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 3h, or 3x rather. Well, I can just do it a little out of order, otherwise I have to redo the whole thing. Minus x squared m minus 3x all over h. Again, these two should cancel out, and they do, because I got a plus 3x and a plus x squared. And what we're left with is a limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared plus 3h over h. Since everybody has an h in it, we can divide the h's out and we get the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h plus 3. Now evaluating the limit, you should first try just plugging it in. If we put 0 in for h, what we get is just 2x plus 3. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your answer. Alright, last example. Um, you're supposed to try to pick which graph matches the situation um, corresponding to time and velocity. So A is a car quickly leaving from a stop sign um, and that one corresponds with F because you can see that there's a spike that the velocity goes way up at the beginning. 
and then a car sedately leaving from a stop sign. So now they're going a little bit slower. That's A. So they take their time going up. Um, a student bouncing on a trampoline. Um, you probably can figure out that that's E. Because sometimes your velocity is negative, that's when your direction is down, and sometimes it's positive and it keeps going, it bounces back and forth. So that one makes the most sense. A ball thrown straight up. So your velocity should um, be positive at first, but eventually the ball is going to come back down, so that one would be B. A student confidently striding across campus to take a calculus test. Um, that one is C because their velocity is not going to change, it's going to stay constant. So it's just a straight line. Now an unprepared student might um, <laughs> might kind of change direction, maybe change their mind about going, or speed up, slow down. So that one's going to relate to D. The only one left. Okay, um, that's it.